Going into interviews, most candidates have the mindset that if they just get one offer from Bain or McKinsey or BCG, they would be very happy with their lives. But as they progress in the interviews and they realize they actually are doing pretty well at this, they then develop the mindset that, well, I may get one or two offers or maybe even three. How do I then make a decision? And what we find is that obviously it's a very rare candidate who gets offers from all three firms. And it's not a question of intellect or superior skill. It just means you have a fit with all three firms and you can solve cases. But a fair number of candidates get offers from more than one firm, usually two. And the question then becomes, you know, how do you make that decision? How do you make a decision which could change the destiny of your life forever? And most candidates look at a number of things when making that decision. And I would say they look at these things incorrectly, or I would say poorly advised, maybe is a better word. They look at things like prestige. How does the firm stack up in the rankings? How does the firm stack up when discussing it with colleagues? What are the salary levels that are being offered? Salary levels tend to be a huge decision criteria for most candidates. And if you consider that, McKinsey tends to pay the least of the big three. BCG is next, and then Bain is next. You know, BCG and Bain need to pay a bit of a premium to attract candidates who may be more attracted to the McKinsey brand. And Bain needs to pay more than BCG and McKinsey to attract candidates to the Bain brand. And in some cases, it could be a 15%, 20%, even 30% difference in salaries. Other issues that are taken into account would be feedback from colleagues and the friendliness of the interviewer. Now, in my experience of both advising candidates and serving as a partner in a consulting firm, I would say none of these will help you. And these are the wrong ways you need to consider offers from firms. Now, all other things being equal, this is what you need to consider. But when I say all other things being equal, what needs to be equal? Let's assume that the firms you interviewed with were friendly and professional. The experience was pleasant. You felt you had developed good relationships with all the people you interacted with. You felt that the firm put your best interest at heart. So that's what I mean by all other things being equal. Now, the context here is which firm do you pick? And let's make it even more difficult. Let's say that you're applying to two of the big firms in the same city and you've been made offers in the same city. So let's remove the differences in cities to make this decision. The first thing you have to decide here is what do you want from the consulting career? Because the firms are different. I mean, Bain is strong in certain areas, very weak in other areas and extremely weak in emerging markets. If you're someone who's really looking forward to doing work in South Africa and Indonesia and Nigeria and so on, Bain is not going to give you that experience. To determine what you want it could be a very important criteria, but it should not be your deciding criteria. Because to be fair, you really don't know what you want until you've actually been there. So a lot of people say, I want to work in emerging markets. And for a few people, it tends to be very exciting and they're very, very they feel very fulfilled in terms of doing those projects. But for many candidates, you don't really know what you want. And while you may come in saying you love to do work in emerging markets, you may end up loving doing work in the banking sector in London even more. So I would say that cannot be your, your decision-making criteria. Salary levels, huge decision-making criteria for most candidates. You cannot look at this. I mean, let's assume you do have differences in salary of about 20%. Let's assume the difference in salary between a McKinsey and a BCG offer was something like $15,000 to $20,000. $15,000 extended over your entire lifetime is worth nothing. Think about it. $15,000 $20,000 over your lifetime. That difference is not going to be static. It's going to change over time. Moreover, when you leave the consulting firm, the firm you worked at confers a greater salary scale to you. So while McKinsey may offer you a less salary when you join them, when you leave as a McKinsey partner, what potential salary could you earn in the market versus leaving as a Bain partner? Or a, let's assume you joined a smaller firm like Monitor and so on. Salary should not be a decision-making criteria at all. It's irrelevant. In fact, you cannot make that decision because you have no clue how you're going to exit the firm. Moreover, you should be looking at the lifetime value of the salary you would earn and not the salary you would earn in the first two years. I mean, that's a very short-sighted decision if you decide that I'm going to join BCG because they're paying me $20,000 more as an associate. 
just for the next two years? What happens after three years? What happens after four years? What happens after 20 years? That's what you need to consider. The work, the work is very interesting because a lot of candidates come in saying, I want to do social work. I want to do work in this sector. Again, I would say be very careful of that. It doesn't matter what sector you work in. If you work at one of the elite firms, they will train you to think and be an outstanding problem solver. And if you stay there long enough, an outstanding business executive as well. So don't be too hung up on a sector, right? Sectors are irrelevant. It's the way you learn to think through problems in a sector. Mentoring, now this is where the rubber hits the road. When you decide which firm you want to join, the single most important criteria you need to choose and think about and spend lots of time thinking about is whether or not you have built a report with a senior partner or a partner and the and is in capital letters and will this partner be willing to groom you and train you now you may think well that doesn't sound right because all McKinsey consultants all bank consultants go through the same training same development and so on that's frankly not true I don't care what anyone says, but in the real world, when you're actually at those firms, some candidates have a better relationship with senior partners who are willing to take the time to train them, develop them, take them to certain meetings, give them guidance, and that is what counts. When you're sitting as an associate who doesn't know what the hell is going on because you've never worked in business before and you need to reach out for help, if a senior partner is willing to open his door to you at from about 9 o'clock to 9 p.m. to about 10 p.m. and explain key concepts and make you feel comfortable about what's happening and talk you through the thinking. It makes a phenomenal impact in your career, believe me. I've met candidates who said that, you know, McKinsey takes us to Kitspool to do corporate finance training. I think this is great. I'm going to sign up. Bain doesn't do this. And I tell them, look, I've never learned anything in these corporate training sessions. Never. Yeah, sure, they sound nice, there's a chance to bond and you meet all these famous partners who wrote all these great books and valuation and so on. But do you actually learn anything in those sessions? Really? Do you learn anything in those sessions? How many people learn things in the case discussion at Harvard Business School? Shouldn't you be learning the stuff before the case discussion and therefore you bring it up in the case discussion? It's the same thing with consulting firms. You don't learn much in those case training exercises or those sessions they hold all over the world, Florida and so on. What you learn and when you learn it is what is important. And you learn most of your things on projects. That's the nature of the game. You learn on projects. And you learn on projects by having access to the right people that are willing to train you and develop you. But beyond that, there are many opportunities that come up in consulting firms. Maybe there's a chance for you to work with a partner to help develop a very important proposal or a very important idea piece or a very important letter which is what how most of the big firms sell, will sell work. They won't sell proposals. They'll just write a very, I would think, insightful letter to a client, which is the way I used to work. And you get a chance to work with a senior partner on that. Talk to him, help with his thinking, meet the client, understand the issues. You don't get those opportunities unless you have a senior partner who's willing to develop you. And of course, senior partners are willing to develop everyone. But... If you don't have that special relationship and you don't have someone who's really looking out for you, you could end up in a very miserable place. And let me tell you some true stories here. When I was a consultant and associate, I would remember very, very clearly, or associate level, the term was different then, I would remember very clearly seeing some of these outstanding consultants, I mean brilliant consultants, being sent into some of the worst parts of the world being sent into the middle of the Brazilian interior to do a benchmarking or organizational design study from some state-owned mining company, or being sent into the middle of the Namibian desert to work on some postal project, or even worse, being sent into the middle of Thailand to do some benchmarking exercise for Toyota. The point is these were outstanding consultants. Every single time the firm had these Friday get-togethers and these guys used to come in roughly every two, three weeks, the firm used to talk about how amazed they were with their dedication commitment, but they were still sent on these horrible projects. Now, I read this in a book. I can't remember the name of the book, but I think it perfectly explains the way consulting works. There are three levels of consultants. They are the one. They are the inner circle. The inner circle has good relationships with senior partners. They are either ambitious and very intelligent. The senior partners know them. They watch out for them. They coach them. They develop them because they don't want them to leave. 
and they certainly don't want them to suffer and want to leave because they think their careers are not being watched and developed by the firm. They fit in the inner circle. They work on the best projects. They work on the crown jewel clients. They work on the most important issues for the most important clients, for the most important officers of the firm. How do you get into that circle where well, it's not about being the most intelligent? It's about building good relationships with senior partners and for them to see what kind of skills you can bring to the table. Sure, the scheduling office in all consulting firms play a role, but they can only play a role to a certain extent. They can put you onto projects that will develop you, but how you develop is a function of the relationships you have at a senior level of a firm. The next layer is what I would call people who are good, but their relationships are not great with the senior people, and they get put onto the crown jewel clients and the key issues if there's space available. And it's the nature of the game. I mean, it happens in every single firm. And then you've got the others which operate in Dante's hell, the third circle. They get put onto the worst projects for the worst clients in the worst parts of the world. They're not hated by the firm. It's not about hatred. It's not about any emotion. The fact is, there is an element of trust. And a senior partner knows that he can rely on someone else more than another person. And he's willing to do that. He also sees a little bit of himself in that junior person. He's willing to take the time to invest in that person. It is the reality. Consulting partners and consultants are individuals and humans at the end of the day, and they make decisions like humans. So when you decide between firms and you decide which firm you want to join, it is imperative. In fact, I would say it has a material impact on the future earning power that you will have and the wealth and health of your family in the long term by choosing a firm where partners are willing to invest in your development. If you don't feel that, connection you should not join the firm even if they are paying you twenty thirty thousand dollars more as you will learn very quickly the reason a firm is paying that premium because they are not offering something the other firm is offering it's basic finance right you pay a premium to compensate for some other deficit you got to consider what that deficit is and whether it's worth it Everything has a price, but is thirty thousand dollars enough and in my books it's not enough because under the right training with the right partner guiding you and teaching you and coaching you, the sky's the limit, really. You can move very fast through the firm, learn the right skills, and leave and join corporate at the right level. And again, the consulting network is extraordinarily powerful. If you were in the right circles in the consulting firm, you automatically join the right circles of corporate, and your career just moves forward at the right rate. So when you get offers from multiple firms, ignore salary and so on. Look at the senior partner and decide if this is someone or a partner is someone who is going to take the time to groom you and develop you. I've actually had candidates who weren't sure go back to the firm and have meetings with partners and talk about mentorship and development and get the partner to commit to say that they will help them. If you cannot get that commitment, don't join the firm. As I said, everything has a price, but look at the long-term value, not the two-year value. As always, I'll be happy to answer questions and I'll be happy to respond in a podcast. Thank you.